everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hassan Yunus. I'm the director at Griffin Consultants. We're a consultancy um, focusing on sustainable solutions. So we design buildings. We mainly focus on the MEP systems. Uh, we look at new buildings and existing buildings alike. Um, I want to compliment the, what Eric mentioned now, the compromise between indoor air quality and um, energy efficiency. I just read an article a few days ago, a few weeks ago, uh, on the requirements of ventilation in GCC countries, or actually in all the world, so it was an ASHRAE published article. And we look at the Kuwait data, you find that the particulate matters of 2.5 microns and the average concentration around the year is around 47 microgram per cubic meter, which is considered very high. So for a proper filter to be used in, the, in, the, in Kuwait, it should be of an efficiency, American efficiency of MERV 16, which is an F9 uh, Euro, uh, uh, with a Euro equivalent uh, filter. So it means uh, your filters need to be very, very, very efficient. Um, uh, to remove those particles, which is very important for your indoor air quality. However, this will increase your fan power and will decrease the efficiency. So it's very important. We're not building buildings to become efficient. We're building buildings for the occupants. So this is the first thing I wanted to tackle is that occupants' health, thermal comfort, well-being is the prime requirement. This is why we build buildings. Efficiency comes next. We need to make sure they're comfortable, but with the least amount of energy used. So today I'm going to talk about what are the technological efficiency improvements uh, in existing buildings, mainly for the space cooling. And I'm going to start with ventilation. Uh, in the GCC countries, uh, let's talk about the UAE, because I come from the UAE uh, market, 80% uh, of energy is used in buildings, um, compared to the EU and the US, where only 40% is used for buildings. So most of our energy actually goes to buildings. If we look at the building uh, systems um, consumption, we look at ventilation, almost 30% of the energy used for cooling goes to ventilation. So it's a very important system to look at. So uh, what are the ways to reduce energy in a building? Now, we talked a lot during these two days on uh, high level stuff. We're going to go now into technical details of really if we go into a building and we do an energy audit, what are the things that could be done to reduce energy consumption? So first thing, you look at the outdoor air, uh, outdoor air, air flow rates. So I know in the uh, Kuwait, you follow mainly ASHRAE 62.1 or 62.2 when you do the calculations. I know ASHRAE 90.2 is uh, also a mandatory um, uh, uh, code that you use mainly for low-rise buildings and villas. So you look at your outdoor flow, flow rates. That's the first thing you can do. Um, you can check the amount of fresh air you have, compare it to the code requirements, whatever you're using here, and try to reduce that amount. Because the more air comes into the building, the more energy you need to cool it down, dehumidify it. So that's the first thing you can do. Now, some buildings, if you're following any lead uh, requirements, the ventilation rates could be 30% higher than your code requirements. So you need to be careful of uh, what, what are you trying to achieve. But as a minimum of acceptable, uh, ventilation rate 62.1, 62.2 are, are the norms normally from ASHRAE. Um, another uh, point is reducing the minimum flow settings in VAV terminals. Let's say this building has a big air handling unit and you have different VAV boxes all over the, the building. Let's say when this room is not occupied, there is normally a minimum setting. So the damper on the VAV box will go down. So that damper could be set at 50%, 40%, 30%. Try to come up with the minimum um, acceptable value. Normally, you can go down to 10%. If there's no one in the room, you can even close it down completely. Uh, minimum exhaust air. A lot of buildings, you have uh, the um, fresh air is one system. The exhaust air is another system. So you see, like, normally exhaust going from toilets and kitchens and general exhaust, let's say, in an office. So you also need to look at that, because the more exhaust you get, the more infiltration, or the more ventilation you need to provide to the building, or the more infiltration you get from, the, from uh, cracks in the building. So very important to reduce the exhaust, so to make sure that um, you still follow the code, you still have good indoor air quality, but you don't really over-exhaust from the building. 
So um, uh, doing some testing and measurements on the exhaust, comparing it to the um, design and the uh, code requirements, and reducing it if possible, adding VFDs, um, like Eric mentioned, this is one of the technology you can do uh, for reducing ventilation, adding dampers and, uh, and fixing the amount of fresh air. Uh, eliminate outdoor air ventilation during unoccupied uh, building morning warm-up, or in this case, uh, cooling. Uh, so let's say we leave this room now, and there's a dedicated fresh air handling unit for this room. No need to keep it on, simply just shut it off. So. During an energy audit, one of the things that you try to look at is to see what are the patterns of every different system, every fan in the building, from what time does it start, what time does it uh, turn off. Most of the buildings we go to, we find that there are some fans that are running for no reason. So the simple measure is just turn them off when they're not needed. Uh, consider a uh, replacement of an all-air HV system with a combination of a dedicated outdoor air system, which normally we call here fresh air handling units, uh, coupled with uh, fan cool units and air handling units. In the old designs, especially in old buildings, you see there's an air handling unit which has a, a connection to the outside air. So it takes, let's say, 15% or 20% of the total air from the outside, mix it with the return, and send it into the, the building. This normally creates issues in control of uh, uh, fresh air. So the better way is to have a dedicated system for ventilation, so you can turn it off when it's not needed. Let's say you have an air handling unit, and you need to cool down the building to 28 degrees C or 29 degrees C uh, when people are not there, and you have a fixed damper and that you can control on the, on the on an air handling unit. A better way is to have a dedicated fresh air handling unit and separate the especially the latent load in Kuwait and Dubai. You have a lot of latent load. Uh, separate it from the fan cool units load. Um, normally with the dedicated outdoor air system you can add heat recovery which is hard to do in an air handling unit so this is also gets you around 50 percent reduction on the ventilation cooling consumption. Uh, convert constant volume central exhaust systems into demand-based control uh, exhaust system or ventilation systems like in this room for instance today let's say we don't have full attendance yesterday we may we may had more people, so we can add CO2 sensors, detect uh, the amount of CO2 uh, particles per million, and then send a signal to the um, controller to reduce the fresh air amount to the expected, um, to reduce the CO2 to the expected or to the level that we need to. We can also have a, have a counter on the door. We know exactly how many people are inside. We add that control system connected to the fresh air handling unit or the air handling unit and reduce the amount of fresh air coming in um, to the requirements. Chillers. Uh, chillers are one of the biggest consumers. We did a study for um, the government of Dubai. Mataz was with me on, on that project. And we uh, studied how much is the cooling system uh, consumption part of a building. So what we found out is around 70% of the energy used during the year goes to cooling. And out of that, <clears throat> almost 80% or 70% goes to the compressors and the condensers. So now we're going to talk about the chiller system that constitutes maybe around 50% of the energy consumption of a building, if you have a chiller. Uh, <clears throat> retrofit chillers with equipment that has high efficiency at full and part load. You can have a efficient chiller, like we just discussed now, the curves that we saw, the different temperatures, it could work great at 46 degrees C, but it could be doing very bad at 35 degrees C, which is more or less the more common temperature here. So you need to look at the full efficiency. If you have a BTU meter on site, you have a power meter, you can easily check what is the uh, efficiency. You can install your own power meter, you can install your own BTU meter, try to check it for uh, uh, two weeks at least and check what is the performance of that chiller and then come up with the, with the uh, retrofit option. A lot of the chill, uh, buildings that say above 20 years, normally any chiller will not last more than 20 years, especially for air-cooled chillers. Um, I just I was with a client yesterday and one of his requirements was to change chillers. Like he told me, I have a building, I need you to come here and tell me what chillers do I need. And his first idea was contacting a supplier and the supplier came in, he saw there was 800 ton chiller. Okay, I'm gonna replace it with an 800 ton chiller. I told him, no, look, we need to justify that load. Maybe the 800 was never even used. 
maybe it's only required 400 tons. So you can reduce your investment, get a more efficient chiller, and uh, come up with the with, their, with much higher efficient uh, building. And a recent audit that we did, the client had four buildings. Out of those four buildings, he had maybe 10 chillers. Only four chillers were actually used during the year. So he had like six stagnant chillers just sitting there doing nothing uh, just because the cooling load was, was done in the wrong way. So whenever you're changing uh, your chillers, you need to uh, reevaluate your cooling requirements and put the correct size. Now, install evaporatively cooled, uh, pre-cooled, or water-cooled condensers in place of air-cooled condensers. Normally, air-cooled is uh, not as efficient as water-cooled. However, you need to be careful of what is the, uh, the source of, the, uh, of your uh, cooling water. So let's say to your cooling towers of uh, evaporative cooler. And for instance, in Dubai, any new district cooling plant, you're not allowed to use potable water. You need to use treated sewage affluent. So you need to look also at your local regulations requirement. Uh, isolate offline chillers and cooling towers. This is very important, especially when you have multiple chillers. Every time we do an audit, we find that the, there are no motorized valves on the chillers, and they're always just open to the system. So water passes by, goes into those chillers, and picks up heat. Normally, you should have a motorized valve. Whenever that chiller is off, the motor valve will, will close down, and there's no water passing by through the, through the chiller. I mean, normally inlet or outlet would work because it kind of shut off. There's no, there's no water, you know, but uh, normally you need to keep it the shortest distance, basically. A um, lot of all systems do not have variable frequency drive or do not have the mechanism to reduce the flow. So one of the best ways to reduce energy consumption on your pumps is by installing VFDs. Um, when you go do audits for existing buildings, you have two options. Either it's a primary system where you have chillers and pump, that pump is pumping uh, water to the chiller and to the building, or you have a dedicated primary pump for the chillers and the secondary pump that takes the water and send it to the building and back to the primary pumps. In case if you have primary and secondary pumps, normally primary pumps, you would want to keep them as constant, especially for all chillers, because all chillers did not have the, uh, the ability to reduce flow on the evaporators and they could freeze basically. So the first thing you do is putting VFDs on secondary pumps. However, you need to look at the system, uh, what kind of valves are being used on the <coughs> fan coils, on the air handling units, fresh air handling units. If you have two-way valves, you might need to change, uh, three-way valves, you might need to change them to two-way valves, which is a bit tricky, honestly, because you go into a building with 20 years uh, old, you, s you look at the piping, they start to leak. Sometimes it's a bit hard to change uh, the, uh, the valves. That's a bit of a tricky part. Install VFDs on compressor motors. Um, could be an idea. However, I would suggest if it's a really old building or an old chiller, replacing the chiller um, completely is a, is a better option. However, if it's a chiller that is only three years old without a VFD and it's running a lot on the part load, VFDs are a great way to uh, reduce energy. However, let's say you, have, you go into a data center where the load is almost constant. So VFDs on the compressor will not help. So VFDs actually, if you look at the full load, they add energy because they are a little bit inefficient. So they are 97% efficiency. So there's an extra energy when you're on the full load. However, on the part load, they reduce the energy consumption uh, hugely. So you look at the load profile and see if, if a VFD would make sense or not. Uh, prevent chilled water, condenser water flowing through the offline chiller, just like we mentioned previously. So this happens on the chilled water side, on the condenser side as well, if you have a water cooled system. Uh, clean evaporator and condenser surfaces of cooling. A uh, lot of places we go to, you find that the chiller is not performing as expected. Uh, there's not much, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, dirt on the surfaces, either is an air cooled chiller the outside surface of the condenser? So the efficiency of the chiller would go down, the capacity of the chiller would go down. So um, proper maintenance should be there, cleaning the um, evaporator and condenser uh, periodically. Uh, controls. Control is one of the really good options to look at, especially if you already have a control system. Normally they don't work. So you go into a building and you find that the sensors are giving wrong numbers. So you need to really be smart about um, what to offer your clients. So 
I say the dumber the building is actually the better. Do not, do not try to put sensors everywhere because if you have too many sensors, probably in a month or two, one of the sensors will start reading a wrong, wrong information, sending wrong information to the controller, and then that controller will give the wrong command. So try to be very clever on where to put uh, sensors. So let's say you have 20 fresh air handling units. It's a big mall. Let's say take Dubai mall, there's maybe 100 fresh air handling units. So we can have an outdoor air temperature sensor on every air handling unit. Or we can have a really good one, because the outdoor air temperature is going to be the same. Whether this FAHU is here or there, the weather is not going to change. So one, putting one good sensor instead of 200 cheap sensors is a better option. So try to think about these things when you uh, uh, approach your, uh, the projects. Uh, optimize multiple chiller sequencing. This is also very important. In a lot of projects we go to, we find that the chillers, they start on together. So they run on low. Uh, loads on low loads, your efficiency goes down, just like we. I think one of the curves were was shown in the previous uh, presentation. So the on low loads, compressors, motors in general, will have very low efficiency. So your consumption goes high uh, compared to your um, sweet spot. So multiple chiller sequencing. Normally, you start loading one compressor up to 100%, then you go into the next compressor and you try to hit that 75% uh, on every compressor whenever you can. So shitter sequencing is also very important. Uh, it causes a huge difference between a properly sequenced chiller versus a non-properly uh, sequenced uh, system where you, the consumption can vary a lot. Uh, you can do this, explore that uh, by doing energy modeling. So you have a lot of software. You can just try to simulate what's going to happen if I'm going to do this sequence. What is the effect on the energy consumption? Now, use VFDs for primary chilled water pumps. In some of the old systems, uh, you don't have secondary pumps. You have only primary chilled water pumps. You need to check with the chiller manufacturer to set appropriate minimum flow limits. So for all chillers, the uh, minimum flow rate is not that high. So let's say you have 100 liters per second on a, on a chiller system. You can contact the manufacturer. He tells you, well, I cannot go below 80 on the chiller. So the amount of reduction is only from 100 to 80. So your VFD is 100% during full load, during part load, it can go minimum to 80%. So that's still saving, a lot of savings, but not as much as a, as, as a newer chiller. And when you look at efficiency or power consumption on pumps, it goes to the cube. So 80% reduction means 50%, 80% reduction of uh, flow or pump speed means 50% reduction in power. So it's still a significant amount. So even at that point where the minimum flow is 80%, it's still a viable solution. Uh, replace all pumps and fan motors with the premium efficiency, efficiency motors. So you have grades for motors like say IE1, IE2, IE3 uh, efficiencies that can be as low as 80%, as high as 95, 99%. Another way is to use the ECM motors, electronically commutated motors, especially for fan coil units. Bit expensive, but they're much more efficient. Normally, when you look at a fan coil, it's around uh, 0.5 watt per CFM, and with the ECM motor, can go down to 0.15 liters per second. You just multiply by two or divide by two. Um, HVAC distribution systems. Now we looked at the production, the chillers. Uh, let's look at the and the ventilation. Let's look, let's look, let's look at the air handling units and the fan coil units. Air leaks is very important. When we do audits, look at the uh, ducts. You might find holes actually, and we did find holes a lot in a lot a lot of places due to corrosion, bad maintenance, workers wa walking on the <laughs> on the ducts. Um, so a lot of places you'd find that there are air leaks that are visible. You can also do some testing to see what is the leakage rate. Um, normally, anything above 500 pascal or 750 pascal, you probably need to do a test to come up with what is the leakage rate. And you can check. This is acceptable leakage rate, or uh, you need to do something about it. Uh, rebalance ducting and piping systems. A lot of buildings have not, not been commissioned properly. So you end up with flow going in the wrong direction. So instead of sending that flow to the first floor, it's going to the third floor. Third floor is getting too much cooling. First floor is not getting any cooling. 
gets they get you get the facility management gets a complaint. What does what can he do? He will just turn on the pumps to full speed. That's the, that's that's what he can do. Uh, although you only need maybe 50% uh, pump speed. So balancing the system is very important. Doing uh, testing, adjusting, and balancing. Uh, provide cooling effect by creating air movement with fans. In this room, normally we would be comfortable at around 24 degrees C, 23 degrees C. If we add a fan, so if we increase the air movement, the air speed, uh, we can uh, increase the temperature. So 26 degrees C at a higher uh, air movement in the room becomes comfortable. However, they're a bit ugly, so you need to be careful from a statics point of view. Uh, select cooling coils with a phase velocity range of 300 to 500 feet per minute, which is around 1.5 to 1.75 meters per second. This will reduce the air pressure drop on the cooling coil, on the filters, and will increase your, uh, uh, decrease your fan consumption. And it also will increase the chilled water system temperature differential across the system. Now, in the Kuwait, you don't have a lot of district cooling. However, in the UAE, district cooling is a big thing, and the companies will will have penalties if your delta T, going back to the plant, goes below 8 degrees C. So this this recording probably will be coming to the to the to Kuwait, and uh, that penalty could be uh, uh, applicable here as well. Eliminate or downsize existing HVAC equipment when improvements uh, when improving a building envelope. So let's say we did an LED change in an office building where the lights were really consuming a lot of power. So it used to be a 20 watt per square meter uh, energy uh, consumption for the lights. Now we change into LED lights with 5 watt per square meter. So that load on the HVAC system got reduced. So we can also reduce the HVAC system equipment if we're doing any renovation for the HVAC. Uh, eliminate HVAC usage in vestibules unoccupied spaces. If the space is unoccupied, just turn off the system. Uh, a lot of areas you find you know, five offices that are running on one FANCO unit. There are uh, solutions, there are something called variable air diffusers that you can install and reduce the speed of the uh, fan coil when it's not needed. But basically, if you have one room, it's not occupied, has one fan coil unit, just turn it off when it's not needed. Uh, replace inefficient window air conditioners with high efficiency, i.e. high SEER rating. So. This is an easy swap. You want to replace a new, uh, an old system with a new system, make sure you get a very efficient one. Employ heat recovery from exhaust air. Um, normally, when exhausting from a building, the temperature would be, uh, the air stream temperature would be at around 24 degrees C, which is the temperature of, the, of inside the building. Uh, ventilating, getting fresh air from the outside, it would be around the air temperature, let's say currently maybe 35 degrees C, in summer it could go up to 46 degrees C. So if we take that exhaust and cool down the fresh air you, from that exhaust, basically, we can reduce the energy consumption for the ventilation system by approximately 50%, even more. So that's a very one of, which is basically that photo. This is a ventilation, this is a heat recovery wheel. So this way you can reduce that cooling coil uh, right here, the cooling coil capacity by uh, around 50%. So the capital cost even of the cooling coil would, would reduce and the energy consumption would, would reduce drastically. Um, uh, convert CAV into a VAV. So adding also VFDs to so the air handling units, similar to what we talked about pumps. The air handling units the, the amount of airflow coming into the room shouldn't be always the same. It should adjust based on the occupancy, based on the loads, uh, based on the outdoor loads and the indoor loads. So putting a, an air, a VFD on the um, air handling unit will reduce the consumption. And consumption is related uh, to the speed of the fan to the cube. So 50%, 80% reduction of fan speed means 50% reduction on power. Um, control VAV system, VFD speed based on static pressure. Um, so this is also a way to reduce the energy consumption of the fan. If you have a control system, sometimes when you do commissioning, that initial uh, static pressure point could be overestimated. So during commissioning, maybe the, the guy who did the commissioning thought 80 Pascal is the required uh, number, and it's actually should be around 20 or 30. So you need to always recheck the, the system and come up with optimization or optimized uh, set points. 
Uh, reset the VAV system supply air temperature set point when the system is at minimum speed to provide adequate ventilation. So uh, supply air temperature, you don't need always to send it at 12 degrees C or 13 degrees C. It can go up higher. Uh, increasing the uh, set point will decrease the cooling uh, consumption. Uh, use high efficiency fans and pumps. So uh, there are certifications coming either from Eurovent or from AMCA that test the fan, the fan efficiency, not just the motor. So the fan itself has an efficiency and then there's the motor efficiency. So make sure you, you provide um, uh, very high efficient fans. Uh, high efficiency air filters. So there are air filters that do proper filtration, but some of the filters do it at um, less pressure drop. So choose the good efficiency uh, where you know, the, the air filtration is being done properly, but at the same time, it's not at high pressure uh, loss. Uh, size ducts and select filter sizes for low phase velocity. So try to increase your duct size. Increasing duct size means there's less pressure drop in the system, and the fan power becomes lower, especially when you're doing renovation. Insulate ducts and pipes. And a lot of old buildings, even if the building's uh, pipes and ducts were insulated, you come and see that the insulation has wear off, so you need to re-insulate that part. It's one of the easiest or the most economical and feasible things to do. In humid climates, especially areas like Dubai, uh, Kuwait uh, in general, uh, during summer you have high humidity levels. Supply air with a temperature above the dew point. So you need to supply the air at uh, temperature above the dew point to prevent condensation on cold surfaces. Insulate fan cool units and avoid their uh, installation in unconditioned spaces. A lot of uh, places I see uh, in the UAE where the, the fan cool unit is sitting in a, uh, in a parking and feeding an electrical room, and that fan cool unit is not insulated. So either put it in an, insu in, in an air conditioned area or insulate the fan cool unit or the air handling unit. A clean heat exchangers, like we uh, mentioned before, so this could be on a chiller, it could be on an air handling unit, any cooling coal needs cleaning. Um, some technologies like UV lamps now are coming into the market, so you put a UV lamp on the, uh, facing the cooling coals, it destroys any bacteria and uh, it cleans the air and reduces the build up on the, uh, on the cooling coil. Uh, identify whether there are any rogue zones. Well, this is a bit too technical, but I'll go through it. So if you have an air handling unit feeding 30 different VAV boxes, you could have two VAV boxes that are always showing that they need more cooling. Whatever you do, and these two boxes are always showing that they need cooling, and that fan on the air handling unit is always at 100%. So try to take out those two rooms, have a separate, add a fan cooling for those two rooms so that the other part of the system behaves uh, properly. Uh, modify supply duct systems to eliminate duct configurations that impose high friction losses on the system. Sometimes you can go to a site and you see that the, like, the duct is moving like a snake. Instead of like going into a straight line, it just goes and you have 23 bends, whereas, whereas you could have uh, done the design with only five bends. So if you're changing the ducts, if it's a deteriorated duct, uh, make sure you do uh, just the closest distance. The, uh, the shortest distance is the best option to reduce uh, uh, fan power consumption. Retrofit multiple zone VAV systems with the DDC controllers at the zone level and implement an air duct pressure reset to reduce supply air duct pressure until at least one zone damper is nearly widely open. So this is if you have, let's say, one air handling unit feeding 10 VAV boxes. Um, the way to control it is either you look at the damper position, so you make sure you keep on reducing the speed of the uh, air handling unit fan until one of those dampers is at its maximum or next near to its maximum. This means if you go below that point, then you're going to have some cooling problems because the dampers will open whenever you have a uh, shortage in temperature. So let's say this room, temperature is currently 23 degrees C, you need it to be 22 degrees C, the damper will open to get more air inside. So you you keep on reducing the speed of the fan until one of those dampers and, and the rooms becomes at around 95%. You don't want it to become 100% because above 100% you don't know if that room is getting enough cooling or not. So 95, 90% is the value that you uh, uh, need to look at. Eliminate uh, duplicative zone controls. Sometimes you find there's one fan coil and you have multiple thermostats controlling the same fan coil. 
doesn't work. You need to have only one one play, one um, thermostat, and it should be placed in a in a um, um, controllable area and also a a place where it's actually reading the correct temperature. In some areas, an audit we did uh, a few months ago, the, uh, the thermostats were sitting in a water meter room, and the fan coils were sitting in a different room. So they're reading something totally different from the room that they are serving. So there were corridors. They were in the corridor, and the thermostats were in the motor meter, meter room that is not air-conditioned. So the temperature was always uh, read on the thermostats so high, and the fan coolant was always running. Now I'm going to talk uh, quickly on a, do we still have time? Okay. So quickly on a case study on a project that we did in, in the UAE. It's called Discovery Gardens. There are around 256 buildings in that uh, project. Um, almost 280,000 square meter gross area. Uh, this is just for four buildings of them, I think. Uh, connected load 12,000 ton. They have a district cooling um, uh, uh, plan there. Uh, the energy cost index <coughs> is around 120 dirham per square meter per year. And the energy use intensity or energy utilization index was around 134 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. And this is taken into account only the landlord area, so excluding the apartments. Cooling consumption uh, was around 24 million ton hour. So the kilowatt hour is only for electricity, and the cooling consumption, since they have this recooling, they get bills on a monthly basis based on the BTU meters on, on, on their building. So methodology, when you are approaching such projects, what you need to do, you start with the um, EUI calculations. We establish what is the current uh, consumption <coughs> per square meter in terms of electricity and cooling, and you compare it to other audits that you've done or other data available from the market. So in the US, you have something called CBECS, Commercial Building Energy uh, uh, Survey, uh, where you, like all the states, have uh, values of what is the um, consumption of their building. So you can compare it to um, another building and see, well, my building is doing like uh, most of the buildings in, um, in its category, so I think I'm fine. Um, you find that your building is really high, a high consumer compared to other buildings, so you can s start saying, okay, I'm gonna do more, uh, uh, I'm gonna do a proper audit this time. Uh, unfortunately, in the GCC, we don't have a lot of benchmarking. In the UAE, we started doing it. There was a publication um, on audits, uh, uh, done, uh, sorry, on benchmarking for hotels. So some data is currently available. I would say Kuwait, if you look at the weather data, it's a bit similar to, uh, to Dubai, so you can take that data and, uh, and kind of compare it to, uh, to buildings here as well. Um, once you get the EUI, you find that your consumption is very high compared to others, you go into the audit. So you go into the audit, uh, do the walkthrough audit, you can do some analysis on site, you can put meters for a couple of weeks to see what is the profile of different equipment, different systems. Uh, you get the bills for the last two, three years and see the patterns. If the, uh, you have uh, weather dependency, if systems are actually running based on the weather or just they're running uh, on, on, on different parameters. So let's say for the data center, the cooling consumption doesn't really matter if it's hot or cold outside because the main heat is coming from the equipment. Uh, you do financial analysis, so we, we come up with solutions saying, well, we're going to change the chillers, uh, we do the design, we do the specifications, and we do the financial analysis, how much it's going to cost, what is the life cycle cost of that chiller, and when is the best time to change it. So it could be that our recommendation that in two years your chiller should be changed because its age would be, uh, the, you need to change it because it just won't be functioning anymore. We prepare drawing specifications, bill of quantities, tendering an award to the contractors, and implementation supervision. Then we do something called measure, measurement and verification. So whatever we propose, we need to measure and verify that whatever we claimed is actually happening. There are two ways of doing this. Either the, the normal uh, building practice where you do a tender to different uh, contractors, or you can do the, the ESCO way uh, where you uh, uh, tender it to ESCO. So it depends on the situation. In this case, for this project, since the payback was only uh, around six months, so in six months, uh, we told the client that you're going to get back your money. And the investment wasn't very high, so the client said instead of giving it to the ESCO, because ESCO at the end of the day will have, 
need to make some profit. So there's some money going to the escrows. And uh, in that case, the client said, well, I'm going to put the money. I'm going to get the contractors. You as a consultant will overview the, uh, the, uh, the bids, uh, select the proper contractor, do the bid evaluation, and implement or supervise on site. So that was the energy consumption basically on, on that building. You can see the different, uh, this is the pie chart showing how much is the chilled water, how much is the common area, fan colonies, how much exhaust. So these were actually measured. So we went to site with power quality meters and we measured every fan, every uh, equipment that's on site, made the profile and put it back in an in a energy modeling software. We came up with exact values of what's happening on that um, on that site. So you can see here that the fan coil the units is only 58% and the fresh air handling units were 42% mainly because they were oversized and they didn't have any heat recovery. So to be sure of what's going to happen if we do any energy conservation measures, we normally use energy modeling. So in this case we use a software called IAS where we actually build the building. This is the actual, it looks like, uh, if you look at, at Google, Discovery Garden, that's how the buildings look there, uh, look like there. And we, in, we, we add all the systems, so uh, in this case, this recooling, the amount of fan coils, uh, the fresh air units, the pumps, all these data is imported into the, into the uh, uh, model. And what we do first is try to calibrate the model. So we have the existing builds, we have the, the data from the building, we build the model, and we run uh, the simulation, and we use the weather data appropriate for that specific year for the bills, and then we calibrate it. We make sure that the, whatever we, results we're getting from the model is exactly the same from the bills. Now we have a calibrated model, we move into the uh, actual energy conservation measures. So here, if you can see, this is the comparison, the two graphs between the bills and the results from the energy model. If they're below 5% difference on a monthly basis, that would be great. Um, also, we, we test the weather dependency um, and we put the energy conservation measures. So one of the measures was here to reduce the fresh air quantity, uh, open the dampers to reduce the pressure drop, changing the pulleys, um, adding controls on the fresh air handling units, uh, reducing the pump speed, reducing the exhaust by installing dampers. And here we can see the four graphs showing the different ECMs, how much consumption reduction is happening with every ECM. So we can combine all ECMs together to come up with the total figure, or we can check one ECM at its own. And then we present it to the client and say, well, these are the options that you have. It's going to cost you this much, and uh, you have to choose which, which, uh, which things to implement. So these are the observations mainly. The differential pressure controller location was not optimal. Pumps modulation is not properly done negatively pressurized building, which was creating mold, so it was also a health issue in the building, no heat recovery, uh, non-centralized exhaust, and partially closed dampers that created pressure drop. Um, annual savings were around 280,000 uh, kilowatt hour per building. If you can see here the different uh, you have a reduction because of the uh, change of the uh, pulleys on the, on the uh, uh, fresh air units, reduction of uh, exhaust flow, relocation of DPT, and recommissioning of the controls on the fresh air handling unit. So the total investment was 1.1 million, savings per year around 3.3 million, and it was less than five uh, months payback. So that was a very quick win for the client. We did the first four buildings, and they told us, okay, you do the next 26 buildings. I just got an email yesterday saying, okay, there's 28 more buildings, do the, do the 28 more buildings. So they're very happy, and um, uh, it was a very simple solution. Didn't we didn't invest a lot of money, or the client did not invest a lot of money, and lot, not a lot of time. So the whole thing was done in two months, the actual installation. Uh, this is basically the cooling reduction was around 20%. And remember, we didn't touch the, the units. It was only on the common areas. So 20% reduction for the whole bill. Electricity reduction of around 34%. And that's it for me. Thank you.